the movie raid show. It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is Ezra Buzzington, actor that played in the remake of The Hills of Eyes, and played in Ghost World and countless other TV shows as most films. Hello! I've, I've never heard of him. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, Ezekiel Bongwater? Is that who you said it was? Well, I mean, that could be your new nickname or handle, you know, if you want to be... But it's funny, I, I do get some mail from a local theater company here in town to Ezekiel Bongwater. What do they can do with film titles? They can do it with your name. <laughs> I got my name from my uh, uh, grandfather's vaudeville name. It was his stage name. And so I, I got it from him when I had to change my name when I joined the Screen Actors Guild from my legal name, which no one knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from Ezra Buzzington to Ezekiel Bongwater seems like a good transition for me. It matches my brand. <laughs> I have a very strange life. I have a very unusual life in, in Hollywood and, and Los Angeles and, and, well, the world, I guess. So well, that's not so bad. That's not the beginning. I mean, everyone takes up a modeling every once in a while, especially with their feet. Whatever. <laughs> I don't have the pays. I'm totally down, and you don't show my face. <laughs> so that's the main rule. You never show my face. Well, the, the, the reason is nobody wants to see it. See, that's the problem. It's not that I don't want to show it. It's that they don't want to see it. They're scared of it. Dude, there you go. Superhero <laughs> feet. <laughs> there you go. Superhero feet modeling right there. That's for you. You know what? I was told when I was a kid, uh, by kid, I mean I was in college, that by the people in the dance department at Ball State University, where I briefly attended, that I, my feet, it was summer, and I just had sandals on or something, like that, and, and one of them, uh, a sort of little diva, a ballerina, saw my foot and said, oh, ooh, monsieur, you have a perfect point. And I went, I didn't even make a point. What are you talking about? She goes, no, your foot, your foot. It's a perfect point. So apparently, I am the envy of all ballet dancers everywhere. Because I have the perfect point. Do you know what a perfect point is? No, I, I do not. I'm sorry. Well, then you need to go back to school and study dance. Because apparently in ballet, there's something called the point. Where uh, you just extend your leg and it goes pointy. I went to the strip club. I went to the wrong bar, apparently. <laughs> you know, I bet you I would give you dollars to donuts, but any one of the women you asked who's working at a club, especially on the pole, would be able to tell you what a perfect point is. I pretty much guarantee you, because those mamas... They know how to dance. They know from their dance. They know Pilates. They know all the whole bit. Because I used to be a dancer, too, but just not on the pole. Well, all right, there'll be a video called. segment for next time, I promise. So, would you please discuss for me the various <laughs> attributes of having a perfect point? Can you imagine? I can't imagine. <laughs> Oh, uh, you can dress like Black Swan, so that way you feel important. I mean, whatever. I'll, I'll, I can be the Nutcracker. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we talk about that just before we started recording? We will have a raffle soon. We'll, we'll let you know. Extra fifty bucks extra for the Nutcracker. <laughs> we'll have a raffle later. We'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, conversation is spiraling into various depths that we yes don't want yes. To, uh, <laughs> So, what have you been doing lately? Uh, have you been uh, getting some more roles lately? Have you been touring the country, Comic Con, and so forth and so forth? I haven't been doing anything. This year, actually, has been very thin for um, a lot of people, and pretty much every everybody I speak with in Los Angeles, for reasons unknown. Some known, some unknown. Um, the business has changed a bit, and there's a lot of runaway production, and a lot of, unfortunately, commercial work is going non-union. So, for all of my union brethren and sisters, it's been a thinner year than usual, it seems. Um, I suppose you might be able to find an actor who would counter that. Uh, but the majority I've spoken with, and this is including me, have commented on how, I don't know, how the industry has changed to the point in 2018 that, that it's just a little bit tougher for everybody. But, you know, everything is, is pendulumic. You know, sometimes it's riding really high, sometimes it's riding really low, and there's just no predicting it. The only rule of thumb is there really are no rules to making it in Hollywood. Um, and you just have to ride it like the roller coaster it is and sometimes throw your arms up in the air and scream we. But as far as anything that's on the horizon for me, I'm very excited to see how this project I worked with, or worked on for David Slate, did 30 Days of Night and various other things, um, and directed me in the television show Crossbones with Malkovich for like nine months in Puerto Rico, which was incredible. Anyway, uh, he contacted me to shoot his short entry into an anthology, a horror anthology called Nightmare Cinema, which also features Joe Dante and it's, as a director, and it's played a couple festivals, I still haven't seen it, but it's played a couple festivals out of Los Angeles, and we'll have a date some point, either the 
the end or early of next year, end of this or early next year, Nightmare Cinema. And it stars Mickey Rourke and several other well-known actors. I think Richard Chamberlain is one of the pieces. And um, I just shot a crazy indie for Kyle Hester, producer Kyle Hester. He's also an actor. He was in the chair with me, and he managed to talk Grady Earls into directing <laughs> an original script called Preacher Six, in which Kyle is actually playing the title role. And I'm a sort of, oh God, how do you describe it? I'm sort of like a Dick- Dickinsonian character, Dickensian character, like Charles Dickens' character, sort of a street nut who's a shyster and a little con man, and he does three-card Monty with these huge demonic angels. It's, it's What I've seen so far looks incredibly cool. So again, that should open sometime next year. Looking forward to that. But it's an indie, so don't look for a wide release. It'll probably be on video on demand, I would imagine. A lot of the business is going straight, uh, you know, downloadable stuff, and I'm fine with that. It doesn't matter as long as the check clears, and I have a good time. Yeah, it's, you know, everybody can check it out, and uh, well, hopefully, you know, because it seems like more independent films are coming out, but it seems it's such a real hassle just to get, you know, just to get some kind of a release, even on the like, even a local theater or a festival. Well, it's it's outrageously expensive. I mean, when even the major studios are sending forty at least percent into marketing, probably more um, for an independent filmmaker. They never can budget for that, so they, they're, they're lucky to get by and shoot the film, let alone finish the film in post, let alone after that get any kind of distribution deal. Because the festival circuit, which used to be a really good inroad, from my understanding, uh, independent filmmakers to find um, distributors who would pick up their film, pick it up and put it out there, and then take the marketing cost. Those are kind of dwindling now. They're not at all what they used to be. And so that's this is why, I assume, one of the reasons many uh, producers and filmmakers have gone the route of downloadable VOD stuff. It's just simply easier to get there, is my understanding. Again, I'm just an actor. I mean, I do produce and direct, but my information is limited on that end of it, but from what I have viewed, this is what I see. You can't get like a standard four-wall distribution deal with, you know, one of the majors, unless you have a huge star, or you have a lot of money behind it, or any one of a million reasons. Um, it has nothing to do with the quality of a piece, ever, ever, and this is my understanding, is my, is my takeaway from working in the business now for about 20 years. It's, you know, talent is great, but it won't get you there. Talent will keep you there, but it certainly won't get you there. Branding, marketing, social presence, um, social internet presence, followers. Those sorts of things now are coming into play far more than the actual ability to do the job. I mean, that's not being spoken from a cynical point of view. That's just simply being spoken uh, from a matter-of-fact sort of logical point of view. Do you think that even when it comes to j- acting point, do you think they're even using actors at a minimal because of, or unnecessary, like a crutch in their future acting? Because, again, it's all about the profit? Well, um, any, pr- any producer worth their salt is only thinking about the profit. So they can't be faulted for that. But I have lost several roles to a name I can't mention, um, who I see very often at auditions. Because in television especially, they would be able to use his name in a trailer. But he's notorious for being on set and a problem and costing them money because of delays and what have you. But still, he gets hired because of the one show he once did that got some recognition. And now the controversy surrounding him pretty much on the social network land. You know, that is what it is. It's like, I get it. As a producer, I would say, okay, well, let's go with this guy instead because we'll get, I don't know, 100,000 more views. But <laughs> I guarantee you, I or any of my friends could outact this poor guy's, you know, ass uh, in, in any kind of act off. But, you know, again, it, it, it's not a bitterness, it's not a cynicalness, it's an understanding of what the, the landscape of the business is and trying to find one's place within that, you know, finding the crevices in the rock to grab hold and pull yourself up. Um, and I get roles he won't get, so it, it is a trade-off. But one cannot be faulted for looking at the bottom line when they're spending tens to hundreds to millions of thousands of dollars in a project. It's just that that's their job. If they weren't doing that, they wouldn't be doing their job. But then it's up to the director, the casting director, and anybody else with any kind of aesthetic influence to push for the level of uh, artistic ability and try and get as much of that as they can out of the money pit that is making movies or television. When you see a a TV show, and and you know... you can tell it's not going to be so great 
Uh, do you think like the investors kind of like seems like a like they intend to to make it a flop just so they can find their actual talent to make a better show that they know they're going to make money off of? Um, it's an interesting theory, and it wouldn't surprise me. But honestly, nothing in the business does surprise me anymore. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. But I, I hold firm to the thought that no matter who it is, regardless of their level of talent or lack thereof, would ever set out to make anything worse than it is. Now, what they will do is they, especially television, they will eliminate anything perhaps with an edge in terms of its humor, and I'm a very edgy actor, so I'll get this a lot. Um, when you're on a set and you do one thing, or you're in, you say you booked a show, and then you go to the table read, and it reads one way. This table read is where you sit around and all the cast is there, all of the producers there, and more often than not, the network people are there. So if you have a joke that is perhaps, or, uh, not even a joke, but a line that is just on the edge of potentially offending someone or, or even just running the risk of that, it will be eliminated by the time you start shooting. And even if you shoot it, odds are it's going to get cut. As a result, I mean, again, they're watching their bottom line. They don't want a Twitter war over a particular line that was set on a particular show. So unfortunately, as a result, what happens is a sort of watering down of any kind of true character, any kind of real depth. And this is primarily network I'm talking about here, by the way, you know, the, the majors. When it comes to the cable, you know, the FXs, um, or the Hulus, obviously, or, or um, Netflix, or any of those, they can call their own shots. But network television is dependent on people not being offended by anything they do. So my experience has been that they will tend to water down anything that's slightly edgy. I mean, look what happened with Roseanne. That's a perfect example. They will water down anything that is potentially offensive or actually is offensive, as was the case with, with her tweet, to save their butts. Everybody in, in, in uh, the business, by necessity, is looking to save their butts because there are hundreds of other people out to get their butts. So that you do have to be careful in Hollywood. You do have to be careful in the business because there are other people who want to replace you, especially on the executive end and administrative end, but also on the creative end. Less so with actors, but certainly true with directors and writers. It's, it's a cutthroat business in a lot of ways, you know, and so it's wise to hold on to your soul firmly with your right hand but keep your left hand, you know, on your hip for the gun, just in case, yeah. without being paranoid. It's not an easy game to play in Hollywood, and the wise participant is aware of all levels of communication within the industry when it comes to like script changes especially like the last second when you're when you're in that moment when you're in that emotion how do you reset that emotion in that in that moment scene uh, when when there's any kind of changes in that moment how do you reset that? which it does which it does quite often <laughs> excuse me um well first of all it's my job to do whatever they tell me to do so whatever the words are i must now then take those words and justify them within the emotion or the um, heightened stake that I was currently playing and find a way into those words to justify my, why my character would say this thing in this particular way, you see. So that's my first priority is to do it. I have no choice. I, I, I don't let myself have a choice. Now, unless you know, you're know you a, a recurring guest star or you have an arc on the show and you're doing several episodes, then you have more of a say. But, but as a visitor, really, to the set, I don't believe that it's my place to question what it is the writers who have been working on these shows for X number of seasons. I can't question what it is they're doing. I don't know my character better than they do. They know it. They created it. And I'm, I'm sort of a catalyst. I'm, I'm the... Um, What's that called? Uh, I'm channeling their world, and I appreciate that, and I like that, I, because I also direct and write and produce. It's, I, I can see why they're making a change, so maybe it's a lot easier for me than it would be for a lot of actors. Some would look, but I've memorized these five words. I can't simply change it to these five words, which is why it's very, very important, especially in, in commercials when there's so much money involved. It's in error for producers to go with non-union actors, because union non-union doesn't have anything to do with talent level. Or look, it has to do with the ability to deliver on the spot when you have 45 people breathing down your neck to do one particular thing right and then change it to do it right-er. And the, the union actor knows they'll do that. They'll make that happen, and it's so fast it'll make your head spin. Non-union actors still aren't experienced enough to not panic, to not freak out. They don't have the well where they can uh, pull up the resources required to actually um, behave in a professional way and deliver. So it ends up costing the commercial people money, but I think they haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> they need to lose a lot of money, so they'll come back to union work.
part. That, like, you think, like, when an actor, you can kind of tell this in, as well as film, when sometimes, usually they're good at covering this, but, like, you can tell either some kind of stretch that isn't related to the character, like, maybe they did have to repeat the same scene over and over just to get it right, and they have to go back to that one moment, that one line, to restart that emotion to get that back in there again and uh, you can see it on, on some actors but it can be it can be a little treacherous at times oh it's incredibly treacherous but I'd, I'd be very curious sometimes to sit with you and watch some some scenes or what have you and hear how you break them down because it's interesting when <laughs> when I'm watching a film for example and I see a particular take and I think oh I wonder if this happened here I wonder if that happened here might be right but odds are I'm probably not it could be absolutely anything else. Sometimes what looks like a um, hesitant performance on the part of an actor is actually the result of bad editing. It's, it, there are so many different dynamics that, that go into making visual art in film and television that it's very, very difficult to break down exactly what might have happened on set. No, everybody will have a theory and they could all be right. It's a sneaky little discipline. It's a very tricky discipline. My only thought when I'm watching something that's maybe not quite working is to allow the creators of whatever it is I'm watching the freedom to guide me through the rest of it because I might just be wrong. So I don't want to get stuck on a particular performance or stuck on a particular camera angle stuck in a particular line. I'll just kind of notch it, you know, I'll have a little post-it note in my head, and then we'll move forward in the film. Sometimes it's blatantly obvious. <laughs> yeah. The interesting thing that I noticed the other day, actually, I was telling uh, somebody last night on, on the carpet about this, this uh, situation. I was, I woke up and I was listening to radio and they were advertising some show. You know, I was asleep to the radio and they were advertising some new television show that was coming on. And they had maybe three actors in the scene. Maybe two, actually. I think it was just two. And they would deliver the line just like this. And then the other actor would deliver the line just like this. And it was all very flat. And it was all almost monotone, but not quite. And there wasn't really any emotion behind it at all. And I, I was listening to that thinking, maybe that's what I've been doing wrong. Maybe I need to... <laughs> literally flatten everything down to the point of just nearly yawning and that will work for network television <laughs> i really don't know it's, it's an interesting study but it is something i noticed so yeah you can watch a film or television show and imagine um or logically conclude what went wrong with a particular piece or scene or performance and possibly be right but also give weight the fact you might be wrong because i've noticed a lot of, a lot of these other actors especially like newer films like let's act as fast as we possibly can like especially in these action or even horrors like they speak of that like okay let's go let's go no, no. it's like I, I i i just missed what the was that a scene was that a motion what what's going on <laughs> you don't give us a chance to understand it Actually, there was some criticism around fincher's um what was it called Social Network, Facebook movie, is that what it was called? <laughs> um, you know the one I'm talking that about. That was like dot com or something. <laughs> Fincher directed. Um, David Fincher, the, the whole thing was like a machine gun. And I happen to love that. It's like, oh, I think that's a really, but it was a choice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's all choice based, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like I said, there's so many things that could, could go on in a scene and stuff like that. Like I said, the theories, everything like that. But I mean, like, it seems like more more newer films. Now we're just doing, like, sagas of... Are we, are we trying to confuse people now by making sagas from the original early sagas of the remakes and we're just squeezing those in? I mean... <laughs> I don't think anybody's trying to confuse anybody. I think all they're trying to do is make some money. They are. <laughs> That's they what are. anybody is trying but to do. But like the it. viewer, the viewer is going to go be like, when they go see it, it's like, oh, did you did you see this movie? Oh, you mean the original? Oh, no. You mean the remake? No, no. They just, by squeezing into like all, all these other sagas and stuff into into something you're going to confuse the viewer. Because like, they're, they're going to talk about it. They know about it. And then they're like, oh, you mean the remake? Or you mean the prequel? You mean the, the original? Or, or are you talking about the new one that just came out? Oh, the same title. Well, yeah, um, but the only reason they're doing the same title and and, and uh, using uh, well retreads basically is because they know that will pull X number of people into a, a theater, if only out of curiosity. You know, they only care if it's good or not because they want the second week to play, the third week to play, the fourth. Don't give people in the business too much credit here in terms of. Well, I think we'll do this just to confuse them. You know, it's just, it's, <laughs> they don't think that far. They think no further than the bottom line of will this bring bucks in seats? It's just that simple. Regardless, and even if they get negative reviews, no, we're going to make another one. Yeah, well, you know, you can't really fault them. I mean, if people go, you know, it, 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 it's uh, it's not up to them. It's up to, up to the movie-going public who decide what they're going to swallow and what they're not. 
It's like if it's a trend or it's not a trend or, you know, if you're nostalgic, guess what? We're going to go for this and we're going to make that. We're going to have this person from here and boom, there you go. There's a couple million dollars just for that. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So without putting too cynical a light on it, yeah, that's, that's probably very true. I mean, it's exactly the same in a way as let's say, okay, well, let's, let's put this YouTube star on a television show. Let's put it in the movie. Not that they've ever done anything like that before, but they have mm, 1.2 million followers, so people will come. It doesn't matter if they end up having a career of it or not. It, the, the star, in that case, would be disposable. The studio or the producer or whoever is responsible for putting the money up and getting that person, that very inexperienced person, <clears throat> to appear on a television show or a film is the one that matters in that scenario because they're the ones that know what they're doing and they're trying to make the money. And they're the ones who will stay in Hollywood. It, uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's a tough business. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 so crazy, but hey, you know, there's always somebody. It's it's an endless chain. It's just gonna keep going and going. There's no, uh, you know, you can't do this type of deal anymore. Like in you know, the early, t- you know, television days where where companies were actually switching other shows around, and then you're like, oh, it's not gonna work. Even though that show actually was popular within the first couple of weeks, and then <laughs> and then disappeared and it came back and became a cult classic. Right, right. Um, again, they don't really care about classics. What they'll care about is money. I'll be curious to see how the new Murphy Brown thing works. I've mixed some, uh, read some really mixed reviews, and I'm a fan of Candace Burton. I think she's freaking great, and I mostly remember the, the original show. I haven't watched the new one, uh, but I was reading something the other day. I said this retread doesn't happen to be landing. It's not grabbing hold. I was like, well, maybe because it was of its time. And maybe, you know, it should not be Murphy Brown. Maybe it should be Candace Bergen as, you know, Murphy Brown or something. Just change the freaking, do something new rather than assuming that everybody wants to watch a show just for nostalgia. Do you watch South Park? Are you a South Park person? I like it, but. Yeah, I I do like it, but I don't. A couple episodes, a couple seasons ago, I think, where they had, at like a Whole Foods knockoff, these little blue berries, they were little berries in a little box, and they were called the member berries. And so you would go near the berries, and then you would hear all the little berries talking, and they'd be saying things like, Hey, remember when that Murphy Brown show was? Oh, I remember Murphy Brown. Oh, I remember this. I remember that. And it's like it, you get sucked into this weird nostalgia that is, especially in our current political times, really tempting to wallow in. And that's what the entire show was about, was about avoiding the present and the future by looking at the past. And this is something that in middle age does occur. And I've seen many people I know sort of turn their their heads away from what's going on to think back of, you know, oh, New York in the 90s, oh, Los Angeles in the 70s. It's like, uh, creepy territory there. I'd rather stay with my feet firmly planted in the present, (laughs) preferably the future, so I can see what's coming, and I know where I am with the world that I'm actually in, not the one I wish I was in. You know, but that's kind of what all these retreads are about, that and making money. You know, well, we will suck off the desperate nostalgia for middle-aged people and a proven property, once proven property, to try and get what few bucks we can get out of it. I mean, it's vampirism in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's, so, there's like all these friends. Right? good writers to come up with something new that's risky, which they will then possibly lose sponsors over. So it, 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 I get it. It's a trap for all of them. I, I'm cynical. I'm sounding really cynical today. I was in a great mood before you called. <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned the Shriek Fest carpet thing last night. There was a... a um, festival here in town for horror films, features, and shorts. And I, I was asked to the, go to the uh, opening walk. So I went, and I thought, oh, there'll be free food and booze. So <laughs> it was a long, long carpet walk. I was like, this is taking a long time. <laughs> and I kept asking each person that I would see next who would interview, I said, where's the bar? Where's the bar? Are we near the bar? Where's the bar? I want to get near a bar. <laughs> Turned out it was a cash bar. Yeah, I was there, too, because I had the vacuum clear, and I was going down as you walked behind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you were doing? I don't know what interview that was. <laughs> of the darkness of Hollywood. Let's get into some more of the positives of working in the film and television industry, if that's possible. Um, good weather? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny about L.A.? I'm originally from Indiana, uh, and I spent many years in New York City. So I grew up knowing and knowing how to dress for and knowing how not to dress for the various seasons. Spring comes, oh, la, la, life. Now we can have sex again. Summer comes, oh, let's work on our tan. That was really... Fall comes, oh, it's starting to come, let's grab a scarf, and then winter comes, you're probably going to die. So, But we'll get through it and get to spring. 
So each of those quarters of the year really mark the passage of time very specifically. You're aware that, oh, that was two years ago, because I remember the winter before last, we had that huge, huge snowstorm, and we couldn't get to the theater, and blah, 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 blah. Whereas in Los Angeles, every day is exactly the same. <laughs> Pretty much the only difference I can see is a slight difference in temperature, like 15, 20 degrees. And then in winter, the air is really, really, really clear, so you can see the mountains a lot clearer, and you see snow on the top of it. But as a result, I was talking to uh, one of my new managers earlier yesterday about this, and she's a Chicago gal. And we were talking about it, I said, we, she has now been here five years, and she says, it feels like two weeks, because it's very difficult to mark time in Los Angeles due to the exact same weather every single day. And then you don't notice it. It's very subliminal. The next thing you know, you turn around, and you've got a 10-year-old child following you, calling you daddy. It's like, well, I thought you were just born. That is a positive. The weather's great. You know, do something deeper than that, though. I mean, about the industry itself. Give me what you got. Um, how about uh, how many transvestites are um, acting these days? Funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> really funny you should say that <laughs> in fact there is quite an influx and I'm pretty happy to say that because a great number of my friends are not only trans but uh, certainly do drag oh nice hey at least they got a job in this show that's pretty cool friends don't so it's a nice <laughs> <laughs> That's probably because I found out your other friends were transvestites. Uh, mine, Alexander Billings, Alexandra Billings, uh, is currently on Broadway. She just opened last week in a new show called The Nap. Alexandra was on um, Transparent as a recurring guest star, or maybe a regular. I'm not sure what her contract was on that. Um, she's a brilliant actress, and she's been working for years, and now she's on Broadway, and I'm thrilled to death. And what's even funnier about that is the, the woman who's understudying her in her transgender role in this Broadway play called The Nap. Uh, the understudy for that is my former roommate in New York City. So like, this is how small of a world we actually live in. There's not only Alexandra Billings, a buddy of mine, playing a transgender role as a transgender woman um, on Broadway, but my former roommate, who's also transgender, Bianca Lee, is now understudying her. So yes, there is a lot more work for, for <laughs> transgender, and maybe drag, but that's a totally different world. And I guess, yeah, I won't say LGBT, but more queer, sort of alienated subculture cultures are, are making their inroads into everything but network television and i think that's great that is great i mean that include everybody in this because you never know you could always have that big hitter right there and just blow you away well plus their perspectives I and mean, are perspectives that nobody can understand unless they've gone through them see them on their television and so they they <laughs> you know they get hypnotized by a new perspective in a very real way now gray is kind of watered down but that's better than nothing. I'm mean, thinking back to, I don't know, what's a good example? Um, well, uh, certainly going back further than I was planning on going, I probably shouldn't mention the name, but it is still true, Bill Cosby, in terms of his show and the advances it made with white America, in terms, oh my God, I didn't know black men could be a doctor. You know, that kind of <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> yeah. To um, uh, more recently, what was I going to use as an example? Oh, Will and Grace is a good example of that. Hmm. Um, how it made it safe for, uh, I guess what could be viewed as standardized and normal, and I use that word very sparingly, America, to view, peek, take a peek into the view of what a really watered down and generic gay lifestyle might be like. But again, that's still a step forward. Yeah, it, oh, it, it's really cool because they're expanding. By any chance, did you catch the film Tangerine? Uh, not recently, no, no. Highly recommend it, highly recommend it. First film ever shot completely on an iPhone. No, <laughs> really? Absolutely great. It's about transgender um, hookers in uh, uh, Hollywood. Oh. It's a, an incredible film, an incredible film. I highly recommend you catch it. And uh, the fact that that film even got made, played at festivals, and was picked up and distributed for uh, regular theatrical viewings was great. You know, I'm, all voices need to be welcomed in this industry, all of them far more than the standard straight white male perspective. It's just it's boring. Yeah, you can't just do the whole, you know, different skin color or different gender, you know, playing a main role in a TV show. It's like, you need to just be open to it and see where it goes, man. Of course. And also see if anybody's going to buy it, which is the bottom line in Hollywood. It has nothing to do with morals. has nothing to do with even politics. It has to do with money. If a piece is going to make money, they don't care who the hell is playing it. They really, really don't. But the marginalized groups have to do their own shit to prove that it will make money. I mean, if nothing else, then uh, most recently, which I still haven't seen, and I plan to see this week with my editor, um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians has just made that point. The same 
one point they made over 20 years ago with another fully Asian film that rocked the box office and caused zero change in the industry. Now, maybe this one will have a stronger effect because it's taken the world by storm in terms of, oh, look, an entirely Asian cast, from what I understand, entirely Asian cast, has brought in a buku bucks. So we should, by logical conclusion, see far more. And it's the non-marginalized viewer's job to watch it and to learn something and to accept it into their reality. And that's what is so, or was so great about America and what, what we can present to the world that the rest of the world really kind of can't. We can present all of these different points of view as being specifically American and, and free and valid and welcomed and valued. You know, it's a hard lesson for, for dying America to learn that it isn't just about, you know, any more old, straight, white men perspective. It's just simply not. You know, as Trump said just the other day, apparently, I, I can't listen to the men speak, but apparently he had said something about, it was a very scary time for men. Well, damn right it is. It fucking should be. But if you're actually paying attention and you're actually involved and you're actually, to some degree, using the word, I hate woke, then it's not scary any more than regular change is scary. There is a place. You, know, you, just, you, you just give up some of the pie. You don't give up the whole freaking pie. It, it, it makes me kind of angry. Again, we're going dark with this. I don't even, this is terrible. You're becoming negative, <laughs> sir. <laughs> my brand. <laughs> I'm not making any money off of this. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of this rant even land? Did it make any sense at all? Or should I just hang up the phone and Guys, go yeah. my cat? Those who's going to listen to this, please leave a comment and, and tell me what he did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that idea. <laughs> Balls in the cage. Balls in the cage. Balls in the cage. See you at the raffle, guys. <laughs> I think I want, if, if it's all the same to you, I would like this episode, if you title them, to be called Ezra Buzzington's Balls Are in the Cage. Could you do that for me? I, I will, just for you. Just for you. I appreciate that. I really, really do. <laughs> Definitely, man. So, okay, go ahead and plug in anything that you're currently working on, and please go ahead and uh, mention your friend that, that about the Broadway play and all that other stuff. My film Mohawk, which was directed by uh, Ted Gagan and produced by Snowfort, uh, he did, and they did, uh, something called People Under the Stairs, which had a huge following. It was Ted's um, first film. Nice. He's a brilliant director. And this film Mohawk is also brilliant. We shot it in Syracuse two summers ago, I think. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's a, an origin story about the making of a mythological mohawk visionary creature, a, a, a revenge creature, wonderful, called the Deer Monster. And I play a really nasty piece of work um, <laughs> who is going after three uh, what I view to be terrorist uh, uh, Native Americans, two mohawk and one British, uh, during the uh, 1812 war, war 1812. And it's a psychological terror ride. It's absolutely wonderful. We get stuck in the woods and we get frightened and sort of deliverance meets, I don't know, something scarier. Um, but anyway, that was just this last week certified fresh. And I don't know if you know what that means on Rotten Tomatoes, but it means that I think all of the reviews, there have to be at least 40 reviews that have covered the film and they're all about 80% meaning they're, they're positive. And so it's like, in, in terms of history, forever and ever, as certified fresh from Mohawk, and I highly recommend listeners go uh, watch that film, not just for my performance, which is you know, pretty darn good, but, but absolutely everything about the film is freaking great. And the last film I shot, which was earlier this summer called Preacher Six, as I mentioned, I think, to you earlier, um, will get distribution at some point next year. You can find that on all of the social sites, just Google Preacher Six, and you'll find it. Um, David Slade's Nightmare Cinema, which is a short film called This Way to Egress, which David asked me to appear in, which I did uh, happily, um, is part of an anthology horror series called Nightmare Cinema that also features Joe Dante, and uh, Mickey Rourke is in it, Richard Chamberlain. Have I said this already? <laughs> you did, but they right. need to know. Anyway, that'll come out next year. They need to know. Well, Nightmare Cinema, so do that. And the only the other weird thing... A film was shot quite a while ago called Dug Up, which I thought was dead and buried. It's a funny uh, zombie comedy. It's very funny what pieces I've seen. is uh, as of October 9th, now available on iTunes, Amazon, Video, Google Play, all of those things that you have to do to do those things that you have to do. Um, there are other things that are in the pipeline that I'm not allowed to talk about right now because they're kind of sort of big, and I don't want to age jinx it and be my manager would kick my ass, so I, I can't say anything about those. But uh, there's a lot to see Ezra Buzzington soon, knocking wood, and uh, he would love for 
for you to come and look at his star. He asked trying to make a living in an entertainment industry. And uh, also in Art School Confidential by Terry Zweigoff, also starring John Malkovich, interestingly enough. And I play a nude model in that, so I come out, everything <laughs> swinging to the wind, whop, 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 <laughs> a lot of fun. Okay, you can be in my film. It's called Funnel Fury. Is <laughs> that right? <laughs> Is it something I can look up and find and, and uh, hold to my heart near and dear? Well, you can. I mean, I can include you in the credit without you knowing. <laughs> yeah, he's in it. <laughs> I mean, I got selfie photos. Come on. <laughs> anyway, uh, there you have it, everybody. That is actor Ezra Buzzington, who is everywhere at this point and will be everywhere in the future. Let me correct one thing. It's actor and asshole Ezra Buzzington. <laughs> well, that's his middle name, but, you know, abbreviate. <laughs> Mike, this has been great. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could understand you a lot better. Uh, well, thank you for pretending to listen. <laughs> it warms my heart. I'm certainly trying. I've got my ears crunched up to the phone saying, what the that's all I'm telling uh, I'm, oh, oh, that is so hey, cold. Did that hurt? Did that hurt? I'm sorry. It'll make a donation. Uh, yeah, that's what you've got to ask your people. It's like, hey, uh, make a donation in my name. Guys, leave a message and tell them to have him make a donation because I've been doing this for like 10 years and I'm broke as, you know. I hear that loud and freaking clear. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about my 1990 Toyota Corolla that needs new brakes. So <laughs> just sing me your sad damn song. <laughs> Really nice to get to know absolutely everybody except maybe if a couple of you. <laughs> but don't cry. <laughs> Take it easy, buddy.